Now, just to give you the heads up this morning, it's going to be a bit of a deep sermon, all right? It's going to be a bit of a heavy one. So, buckle up. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of scriptures, hopefully not too long, but just setting your expectations here because maybe it'll be here. But today I am talking about the false doctrines of Calvinism. I'm going to talk about Calvinism, what Calvinism is, and why our church rejects Calvinism. If you haven't read it on the website, we reject Calvinism. You say, Victor, are you a four-point Calvinist, a three-point Calvinist, a one-point Calvinist? I'm a zero-point Calvinist. I reject all five points of Calvinism, and I'll explain to you why this morning, what those points are, and why uh, we are not a Calvinistic church, why, why we are not a church that's called so-called you know, reformed theology. We are a church that believes the Bible, and we believe salvation and free will. All right, so this is why we read Romans 9, but I'll start first of all at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, where the Bible says, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The simplicity that is in Christ. See, salvation is simple. So if you understand salvation, it's very easy. You know, we have, I summarize it normally in five points. You know, we've all sinned against God. There's a punishment. You know, God provided salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ by dying on the cross for our sins. We accept this gift through faith. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fifth one is once we're saved, we're eternally saved. Right? It's very easy. It's very simple. You know, when people get into work salvation, that's when salvation starts getting complex. Because then it's all, well, did I do the right thing? Did I do it in the right scenario? Did I do it in the right time? Did I do it enough times? You know, you never really know. That's why it's complex to, to earn your salvation by works. In fact, it's impossible. But true salvation is easy. It's simple. We don't deserve salvation. Jesus gives it to us. It's easy. Right? Now, Calvinism perverts these last three points. It perverts that how God provided salvation, right? It, it perverts how we accept the gift, right? And it also perverts also how you keep that gift, right? Eternal life. Now, Calvinism is a system of theology, like I said, that, that perverts this simple gospel. And it's sort of summarized in five points. Now, when people talk about reform theology, or you hear people talk about Calvinism or Arminianism, uh, we'll talk about those a bit later, you always hear this word being thrown around, that God is sovereign. God is sovereign. Right? Now, this is not a debate over, over whether God is sovereign or not. Right? It's like with the, the topic of repentance. It's not a debate over whether repentance is part of salvation. The question is, what, is, what do we mean by repentance? What do we mean by sovereign, right? So when the Calvinist says God is sovereign, what they mean by that is God is like a puppet master that's like controlling everything, right? That he, he makes decisions for you, that you don't always have either full free will or you might have partial free will, things like that, that God is pulling the strings, right? When we talk about sovereign, we just mean God is in charge, right? This is a... I looked up this, I don't look up my definitions in Google anymore, evil Google. I look up my definitions in DuckDuckGo. <laughs> DuckDuckGo. You look in define sovereign, here's what you get. One that exercises supreme, permanent authority, especially in a nation or other governmental unit, right? So, is God sovereign by that definition? Of course, right? He exercises supreme, permanent authority. But what he doesn't do is make every single decision for everyone. He's not like a puppet master. Right? There's a lot of evil in this world. If you think God's just controlling everything, and there are different degrees to which they think God controls everything. If you just think God's controlling everything, and he, is he causing all the rape and the molestation and the murder? I mean, is that the sort of God we serve? I mean, if he's just controlling everyone's deep, darkest desires for sin? No, that's man's evilness. That's man's free will, right? So that's why it's not that God is just controlling everything. Do we believe that God is sovereign? Of course he's sovereign. He's overall. Now, does he have the ability to control things? Of course he does. We're not saying that he's unable, that man is just so powerful, his free will is so powerful, he just can throw God out of the way. No, God is able if he wants to, but he doesn't because he allows the free will in man. A lot of the evil that happens in the world is obviously called 
but, um, because of man's wickedness. Now, Calvinism is defined by five points. You might have heard of the five points of Calvinism. And the way you can easily remember it is it goes after the flower tulip. Right? So they remember the tulip is the five points of Calvinism. And each of those, this is an acronym, and each of these means something, and then you can remember what Calvinism is. Now, where did Calvinism come from? Now, Calvinism gets its, na its name from this French bishop. Right? He was a, a, a bishop in France. His name was John Calvin, and he lived in uh, the 1500s. Right? And he's the one that sort of first taught and where it gets the name Calvinism. Right? So he was teaching Calvinism, which is now known as these five points of Calvinism. But what actually made it like, popular and it sort of gained traction is one of his disciples, right, I think lived in Geneva, uh, was John Knox. Right? So John Knox was his disciple. And John Knox was the founder of the Presbyterian Church. Right? He was a, one of the big players in the Protestant Reformation and was a big part in the starting of the Presbyterian Church in Scotland. And that's why when you go to a Presbyterian Church, I went to a Bible Presbyterian Church, that was the first churches I went to, one of their main distinctives is that they're Calvinists. Right? They're, they, but churches that are, when you hear this word Reformed theology, this is, this is what they mean. They mean this Calvin, Calvinism and tulip. So we are, we are not a church that uh, follows reformed theology, right? So John, John Calvin started it. John Knox is what spread it through the Presbyterian Church. And then during the Protestant Reformation, right, they were debating Calvinism, Arminianism. And then there was this synod, right, which is basically just a council of church leaders that get together. And it was called the Synod of Dort, and it was held in Holland, right? It was a Dutch council. And then they sort of decided Arminianism was not right, which is free will, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but then Calvinism, which is God chooses who's saved and, and the points of... So that's why it became a distinctive of the Reformation, and this is why they call it Reformed Theology, because the Reformers rejected um, Arminianism. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's biblical. That just means it's a bunch of people got together and decided for them that uh, that's what they believed. So that's where it comes from, and now it's known today as Reformed Theology. So you, that's why sometimes you'll come across a Baptist church, but then you'll see they're Reformed Baptists. So Reformed Baptist means they are Calvinists, right? They follow these five points. Now, what are the five points? Let's go through them. And I'll spend most of my time on the first two points, because that's where most of the argument is. The last three points are quite quick. All right, so the first point, the first T in TULIP, stands for total depravity. Total depravity. Now, what does that mean when they talk about total depravity? Now, if somebody just means we're sinners, that's what we believe, right? But that's not what the Calvinist means by total depravity. They mean, that they, they mean that a person is so sinful, their sinful nature does not even allow them to exercise faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they mean by total depravity. It doesn't mean that they just come short, but yet we still have the free will of the mind to accept the grace from God. They're saying we are so sinful that we do not even have the ability to accept the grace from God. And this is why it goes into the other points that we'll talk about later. Now, hyper-Calvinism, so Calvinists tend to differentiate between Calvinism and hyper-Calvinism. Right? So Calvinism says, yes, you know, God chooses who's saved, because we're to totally depraved. For hyper-Calvinism, they distinguish to say, well, hyper-Calvinism is you absolutely have no free will at all. So hyper-Calvinists believe, you know, you didn't actually make the choice of what clothes to wear this morning. Did you know that? Did you know it was preordained before the foundation of the world that you were going to be wearing that high-vis, Sam? You didn't make the choice this morning. It's like, that was God that made that choice. And every little, that's what hyper-Calvinism is, just God's apartment. And that's like a completely wicked picture of God, because like I said, if that's the case, then, you know, is God causing all this evil in the world? Of course not. That's man's wickedness. That's the absence of God's goodness and his grace, right? Where man does evil. Now, let's look at some verses. Now, what's the problem with total depravity to the point where somebody can't even believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we're all familiar with John 3, right? Let's read from verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 
What does the word whosoever mean? We just sung whosoever will. Whosoever means anyone. Anyone who believes can have eternal life. Now, if it's only some people, because we're just so depraved, we can't even believe. How would this even make sense? Why would God say you need to believe on Jesus Christ when you're not even capable of doing it? It doesn't even make sense. Right? And the only people that do it in Calvinism are the ones that people, God allows them to do. He makes them do it. So how would it even make sense for the Bible over and over again and say, if you believe, if you believe, whosoever believes, whosoever, and it's not even your choice. You can't even do it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know the way the Calvinists understand these verses? They're saying, yeah, it's whosoever believes, but they only believe because God allowed them to believe. Right? As opposed to it just meaning what it says, is that it's open to everyone. Anyone who believes, and it's your choice to believe on Jesus Christ, because you are able to make that choice. Right? For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because God didn't give him? No, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Right? Not that God didn't make him believe. It's because he didn't believe on the name of the only begotten Son of God. Let's look at John 5. Look at this. Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Look at this. And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. See, it's not that you're not able to come to him. He's saying to them, you will not come to me. You're making a choice not to come to Jesus Christ that you might have life. Revelation 22, and the Spirit and the Bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, this is where we get the song from, let him take the water of life freely. Now why would the Spirit be begging you to come when the Spirit in Calvinism, the Spirit has to give you the faith first before you can even come? Does that even make sense? It's like God's begging people to come and be saved, but then it, He holds the key. You can't even get saved, you can't even believe, because He doesn't even let you get, get saved. And this is why it doesn't make sense. All right, John 4, another one. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest, see how it's her, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Right? So the Calvinist has to like twist all these verses to fit their position, right? And every time they see a verse like this where it's somebody making a choice, they'll say, yeah, but they only made that choice because God allowed them to make that choice, as opposed to God calling all and we respond to that. Ephesians 1, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So you see how we get saved based on our response to what we hear. We get saved because of our response to what we hear. Now, what are some objections, right? So I'll just go over some objections quickly. And I'll explain to you uh, how you'd understand them from our point of view. Now, you might have heard this verse before where people say, yeah, but, but the Bible says here in John 6, 44, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. So you see there, there must be a drawing from God first before you can respond. Now, do I agree with that? Yes, I do agree with that. I agree that God seeks first and we respond. But what they're missing is, is God draws all, right? Just like the Spirit and the Bride say, come to all. God makes the first step. We respond to salvation, right? We don't initiate salvation. We respond to God seeking us. John 12, 32, look at this. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, look at this, will draw all men unto me. You see? So yes, is there a drawing first from the Father? Yes, but he draws everyone. So it's like many are called, but few are chosen. And we'll talk about that one in the second point. 
Romans 3, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Now, that, is that true? Yes. But why then can we get saved? Because we didn't seek God. We responded to God seeking us, right? They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So I say, like, how can somebody get saved when none seeks after God? Because you don't have to seek after God. It's God seeking you, right? For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. So yeah, you respond to God seeking you. That's salvation, right? You're not trying to follow, try and find, you know, some people are, right? So some people are already trying to do that. But I'm saying salvation is not that. So even if somebody isn't, salvation can still come to them and they make the choice to receive the Son of Man who is seeking to save them, that which is lost. All right, let's go on to the second point. This is where I'm going to spend most of the time because this is really the main point of contention in Calvinism and the main sort of distinctive in Calvinism, which is who decides who gets saved? Is it your choice to believe on Jesus Christ or do you only believe on Jesus Christ because God has selected you for salvation before the foundation of the world. That's the main crux of the argument between Calvinism and people that are non-Calvinists, right? Is they reject this idea that salvation, the choice of salvation is God's. And we say, no, the choice of salvation is yours. It's in your court. It's not in God's court. God offers it freely to all. So unconditional election, what is this? So all the points string together, right? They all make sense together because when you have one, the rest kind of follow. So because man is totally appropriate and unable to choose God, to, to put their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, you stand for unconditional election. So because you can't choose God, God must choose you. But we know that not everyone gets saved, right? We know not everyone is saved. So what's the difference between who God chooses and who God doesn't choose? Well, this is why it's unconditional election, because it's just completely no reason at all, just because for God's glory, he has selected some for eternal salvation, and he has selected some for eternal damnation, right? But the Calvinist will say, well, no, he didn't select them for damnation, they're condemned by their own sins, right? But you still are left with the fact that he offered it to some and not to all, right? The hypercal, or the, what's, there's something called, um, and this is what is known as predestination, right? Predestination is predestined for the foundation of God, choose un uncondition, not unconditionally, but means that there isn't a condition for salvation, right? There's not something that must be done, a condition, in order for you to be saved. It's saying there's no condition you have to fulfill, it's just God's arbitrary choice according to his glory. And who art thou that replies against God? That's what they say. Like, God can make that choice. We can't question it, right? I mean, just that's the same. Which is, if it's true, like if Calvinism were true, that would be the right stance. If God just selected some to damnation and some not, then who are we to say to God? Who art thou? That is the case. But that's not the case because it doesn't line up with all Scripture. So there is also something called double predestination. So that's just predestination. God chooses who's saved, but the rest are just condemned by their own sins. Double predestination, when they talk about this in this argument, is you have some that God has chosen to be saved, but God also chose who would be damned. Right? So it's a small distinction, but it's, it's very similar. Right? So one is God's only choosing. Right? So they kind of say, this is how they describe it. I hope I'm not losing you guys. It's like, it's like if uh, you have two kids on the road and they're about to get hit by a car. And if you save one of them, You'd be like, well, you're good because you saved at least one of them, right? You didn't just let them both die. But you didn't choose to actually kill the other child, right? But double predestination is like saying, like, he put one child on the path and put one child on the road. <laughs> so it's like he actually caused that child to be damned because he, that's the double predestination. So most Calvinists would reject that, right? Now, what are some verses against this point, right? That God just chooses who is saved and who isn't. Well, the thing is because it's your choice, right? John 8, 24, look at this. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. See, unconditional election 
already isn't even true by Scripture because there is a condition for salvation. It's faith. You know, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. That's what Philip said to the Ethiopian youth. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So faith is the condition in order to receive that grace. It's not just unconditionally given to anyone. Here, John, here Jesus is saying in John 8, you will die in your sins. Why? If. There's the condition. If ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now this is where I don't know how Calvinists even get around this. And they don't. Because even if you look at prominent Calvinists like John MacArthur, or you talk to any Calvinist, and you ask them this question. You say, look, here's 1 Timothy. This is not the only place that says this in the Bible too, right? But this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour. Look at this. Who will, what does this mean? Will, like whosoever will, a desire, what do we want? Who, who, which is God, who wants, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So what is this verse saying? This verse is saying that God wants everyone to be saved. Like in 2 Peter 3, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He says it's very clear. God wants everyone saved. What's God's will? Is God's will that only some are saved and some aren't saved? No. God's will is that everyone be saved. So let me ask you, if God wants everyone to be saved, why is he only enabling some people to get saved? Wouldn't it make sense that if God wants everyone to be saved, that he would then allow everyone the opportunity to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Right? So it doesn't even make sense. It's like Calvinism is like teaching that God did something against his own will. Right? He wanted everyone to be saved, but then he doesn't even allow everyone to be saved. How does that make sense? And this is why the Calvinists can't sort of line up. It's like, how can everyone want it? It's like, well, we just have to, what they'll say is, we'll just leave it to God. Just leave it to God. Which is fine if you don't have an answer or another position that makes sense. But I say to the Calvinists, Calvinist, look, there's another way to understand the scripture that does make sense, that doesn't leave you with this contradiction, so take that position. Right? You don't need to take the position based on some five points of Calvinism uh, when it doesn't even line up with uh, what God is saying that he wants for everyone. Right? Luke 13, this is the parable of the Great Supper. There were present... Uh, oh, sorry, this is... No, this is... Um, Luke 13 is where some people had died and then Jesus is saying, hey, they need to repent or they'll likewise perish. Luke 13, there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things. Verse 3, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So you see how it's them to choose whether they will turn and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. All those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent ye shall all likewise perish. So why is he saying the exception to you perishing is that you repent, right? You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the exception. But that's not the exception to the Calvary. The exception is whether God selected you, whether God elected you. The exception does not sit with you. So you see how this doesn't make sense. Luke 14, 16. This is the parable of the Great Supper. Then said he unto him, certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready. So if you think about it, when we interpret this parable based on how we know God operates, is he's calling all. Spirit and the bride say, come. And they all with one consent. So this is who he initially called, right? This is talking about the Jews here. And another said, I have married a wife and there I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord, so, so his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry said to his servant, so the initial guests that were invited in this great parable of the Great Supper rejected the invitation. Right? Then the master of the house being angry said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. 
Now, does it look like God's being selective there? Does it look like he's only electing certain individuals? Sounds like he's telling his servants to go out and just go everywhere and just whoever wants to come can come. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded. Look at this. And yet there is room. So he's saying like even the ones that were called first, rejected, go out, bring all the poor, maimed, lie, anyone who wants to, they all come and they say it's done. Hey, there's still room in the house. And he says here, yeah, and the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. See, does that look like a God that doesn't want some of the people to have the ability to believe on Jesus Christ? Of course not. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. So notice, even in this parable, you see, and we'll talk about this a bit later, you'll see that God did give those people that rejected them the ability to come to the supper. And only once they rejected, then he said, you know what, now they will never come to my supper. Now that's a very important doctrine, right? Because that happens. That can happen where you can run out of chances to get saved. You know, you don't always have chances to get saved until you're dead, right? Because you can, if you keep rejecting the invitation to the supper, God can one day go, okay, then you're not coming. And even if you wanted to come at that point, you won't be allowed in, right? So we see that there. And that's very important when we talk about some other verses later. Romans 9. Let's go to Romans 9. Let's talk about some objections. This is where I'll spend a bit of time. I want to explain some of these verses where people will use to teach Calvinism. Right? I'm trying to give you an answer to help you understand how to understand these verses in light of all the scriptures that we just saw. All right, Romans 9. This is where we started. Romans 9 is a big chapter for Calvinists because what they believe this chapter is talking about is God selecting the individuals that are mentioned here whether or not they will be saved or not as opposed to other things that they were you know, raised up or taken down to. Right? Romans 9 eight. that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Now this is, this is the topic of... Of the, of the passage, right? The topic of the passage is not so much who God is selecting to be saved and who isn't, right? Even though he mentions those that accept the promise are saved, are children of God, but he's emphasizing the fact that people are saved not because of something they do, but because of a promise that God has made, right? So he's saying it's by a promise of God, it's not by their own works. And he's likening this idea that sometimes things are done because of the word of God rather than what people do. And this is where he goes into verse 9. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. So that is in regards to salvation, right? Because this is saying salvation, like salvation, is not based on works of grace. It's based on God's word. There are also other situations, now he's going to talk about, that are because of God's word, but he's not talking about the individual salvation, right? So let's go on. Not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, and Esau, but Esau have I hated. Now, if you remember the story in Genesis, Jacob and Esau here is not representing two individuals. These two people represent two nations. If you remember when, when um, God came to um, Isaac and Rebekah and said there was twins in the womb, he didn't say there were two men inside the womb. Remember, he said two nations are in there. Right? And that's why there was a conflict between na the nation of Israel. This is where you get Israel. I don't know if you know, Jacob was renamed Israel. That's why you get Israel. So Israel is actually the name of a person, right? Who's the, the uh, Israel. Esau is Edom. So when you hear the Edomites, they are the descendants of Esau. Right? And there was conflict between Edomites and, and the Israelites, right? So, and, and who ended up inheriting the promises? Which nation? Jacob. Now, what he's saying here is 
Israel was chosen over Esau, not because of anything Jacob did, right? That just was God's will, right? So it's like, with, with like so what he's likening it to with the promise of God is that we, we didn't determine how we got saved. God determined how we got saved. Jacob and Esau didn't determine who would rule and who would be the, take on the blessing of Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. God decided that. God decided how that would work. Right? So that's the situation. He's not, he's not teaching here that God gave Jacob the faith to get saved, but God didn't give Esau the faith to get saved. This has nothing to do with this elder shall serve the younger. The elder shall serve the younger, meaning this tribe, this nation will be servant to this nation. Right? Which is what these men represent. What shall we say then? Is there righteousness of God? So what he's saying here, hey, is this unfair? Right? Is it unfair that God chose one nation above another in order to pass on that blessing of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? He's like, no, that's just, that's, God can raise up who he wants and not raise up, he can promote who he wants in the world and not promote. Right? Just like, you know, is it unrighteous? You know, remember how um, in, in Ezekiel, remember how the, 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 the prophet was saying, you know, uh, but the Lord's ways are unequal. And he says, are not your ways unequal? Are not my ways equal? Right? So that's like in regards to salvation. People are like, well, it's not fair. You know, people say, well, it's not fair that somebody's tried to live as, as good as they can, but just because they didn't believe on Jesus Christ before they died, they go to hell. But the person who's like sinning and sinning and sinning, they believe on Jesus Christ, they can go to heaven. That's not fair. That's like people saying, what shall we say? Is there unrighteousness with God? Hey, that's how God, that's how God has said it. And if you believe on Jesus Christ, you're saved. That's grace, that's salvation. And if you don't, you trust your works, you're going to go to hell. Even if you were a better person than the person that believed on Jesus Christ, are not your ways unequal, are not God's ways equal? So that's what he's saying here. He chose one nation over another, but that's just how God has done it. So, yeah, but it's not the unfairness and going against his will of not even allowing Esau to get saved when he wants Esau to get saved. Right? But Esau, we know, wasn't saved, right? But Verse 15, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So you can see how the Calvinists would understand this. They're saying mercy, meaning mercy in order to get saved. But the mercy here is who is being raised up and who is being taken down. Right? in that authority and in the two nations. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh. So there's the two examples, right? Jacob and Esau. Now you have Pharaoh. Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. See, did God get glory in Egypt because just because Pharaoh wasn't saved? No, how did he get glory through the hardened heart of Pharaoh? Is he raised Pharaoh up to be the leader of Egypt, and then therefore he showed his wrath on Egypt by having the leader of Egypt reject him? Do you see what I mean? So it's not whether he was saved or not. He raised him up so he could show his wrath because now it's the leader, Moses, versus Pharaoh. Right? So even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. So what is it, the mercy that he's talking about here? He's talking about raising somebody up or bringing somebody down, right? lifting somebody up or humbling them. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he harden him. Now if you go back and you read the account in Exodus, God knew he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart. But when you read through, and every time Moses comes, what do you notice? Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then God hardened his heart. So you see how Pharaoh still had the choice to change. Right? God just knew that he wouldn't. So God knew he was eventually going to harden Pharaoh's heart. But Pharaoh hardened his heart first. And it's just like that parable of the Great Supper where they were bidden and they rejected, and now he's saying, now you can't come to the supper. That's how, that, I do believe that's how it works. And people are still given the opportunity to begin with. That will say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault for who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? 
Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? So this is the sad verse of Calvinism where they say, yeah, God's just not given people the opportunity to be saved and too bad. You're condemned eternally. But if you just say, well, God lifts some people up to a prominent position and some people don't get lifted up, that's in this life. Yeah, okay, there will be some ups and downs in this life, but this life is not all there is. There's eternity, there's a balancing scale. Like Job lifted up, but he was also brought down low. Right? So that's what it's talking about when it talks about vessels of mercy and vessels of wrath. Some people are raised up like Nebuchadnezzar and then God can show his wrath and then he was also brought down to a vessel of mercy and he responded the right way. Nebuchadnezzar got saved. Pharaoh did it. Right? That will say then unto me, what did the other find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but O man, who art thou that replies against God? We'll go on to verse 21. Hath not the potter power over the clay? of the same lump to make one vessel unto honour and another unto dishonour. So you see the assumption here of the Calvinists is that's talking about salvation. But the right way to understand this is this is just talking about how people are lifted up in this world and brought down, right? Vessel unto honour, vessel unto dishonour, right? And it's basically saying, look, if God has chosen you to have a harder life than others, then it's like, who art thou that replies against God? It's like, God did that to Job? He didn't have the right to reply against God. He just had to trust God that God knew what he was doing. Now, it's still fair because this life is not all there is. Do you see the difference? So this is why I don't have a problem with not questioning God if he makes my life hard, right? If I'm brought low, if I'm a vessel unto dishonor, right? If I don't get to be a vessel and be brought up and be somebody great. So that's Romans 9. Let's, let's go to Romans 8. This is another one. We'll try and go through as many of these as we can. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So the Calvinists will say, ah, there it is, predestination. You're chosen to be saved before the foundation of the world. And that argument is about as deep as people that say, ah, there's repentance. See, that's why you've got to repent of all your sins to be saved. What is actually being predestinated here? Now, predestined means that something is chosen before the foundation of the world, a plan that is put in place. But what is actually predestined here? Is it predestined that you would be saved and have eternal life? No, it's predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So what is this teaching? It's saying all those that will believe on Jesus Christ, God has a plan for them. And one day the plan is that we will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And that is true, because once we shed this flesh and the resurrection, we put on a new body, that body will be in the image of Jesus Christ. That plan was predestined before the foundation of the world to apply to any that will receive that grace. Right? So the grace is received by faith. That's a free will choice. But it's like as you, it's kind of like you have the free will to join Australia, become a citizen. Now, when you become a citizen, right, you, you get to enjoy certain benefits. Right? As a citizen, you know, Australia will let you back into the country if you're out in COVID or whatever. You know? So you get like these certain benefits. Now, what if they said, well, while, when they established the country, they already planned these benefits to be for Australian citizens. That's what God is saying. He's, he's planned these things for his people. But you make the choice whether or not to be one of his people. You choose whether to join the nation. Right? But God has plans for that nation and everyone who is part of that nation. That's all it's saying. First Peter 1. So God knows, because it says here, for whom he did foreknow, not whom he did for choose or for elect. Does God know who's going to be saved? Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. God knows everything. We're talking about whether God made the choice. So whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate. So he knows who's going to get saved and he has a plan for them. 1 Peter 1, elect, look at this, according, so we're chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. That's the uh, 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 introduction to 1 Peter 1. Ephesians 1, look at this, this is another one. When you talk to a Calvinist, you always come across Ephesians 1, right? Because it's got those words chosen and predestinated, right? So it's got those words, that's the word that they're going to go to. Verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy 
and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, if you understand what I just said before, you understand what these verses are actually saying. Now, is this saying, according as he has chosen us to be in him before the foundation of the world? No, he's not. What, no, he's, what he's elected is not who will be saved and who won't be saved. He's saying, according as he hath chosen us in him, right? So those of us who are in him, how do you get in him? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Before the foundation of the world, so what has he chosen for us in him before the foundation of all? That we should believe and be saved? No, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So like I said, he has a plan for us to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's what it's saying here. Because when we're conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, we're going to be before him without blame and holy before him in love. That's what's chosen here. Not chosen who has faith and who doesn't have faith. Okay? Verse 5, having predestinated us. What's predestinated? Who has faith and who doesn't have faith? No. He's predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. So what was part of this predestined plan for those of us who are saved? To become children of God. Right? So you see how we could be holy and without blame before him in love, but we may not be considered children of God. We may be considered children of God, but um, what was the other thing that was uh, predestined? Oh, well, we might be not conformed into the image of his son. We might be conformed into the image of something else. Right? But be considered children of God. But God is saying, no, there's a plan that you're going to be conformed. For those that believe on Jesus Christ, you'll be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. You're going to be holy and without blame before me. And you're going to be considered my children. Right? And it's the same here in verse 11. Whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him. So what else was predestined? That we would have an inheritance. Right? Because as children of God, we inherit all things with Jesus Christ. That's what's predestined. The plan is predestined, not who is included in the plan. And even Ephesians 2, a verse as clear as Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's pretty, that's pretty clear that we're saved and eternal life is a gift from God, right? Like it lines up with every other verse that we know. Do you know how the Calvinist understands this? The Calvinist will say, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It, they think this it is referring to your faith. And they'll say like it, the faith is a gift of God. Not everyone gets it, right? Not of works lest any man should boast. The faith is the gift. So it's not that faith is not something you already have that you then exercise to receive the gift the very faith that you have is a gift. That's what, how they that understand this verse. Now, what the Calvinist believes is that faith, like I said, is not given to everyone. This is how God elects people. God elects people by giving some people faith and the repentance, right, which is something else they believe, and also um, gives them the faith, and that's, that's how he elects them. Now, look at this. This is Romans 12.3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God, look at this, hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Do you see how God has given everyone a measure of faith? So not everyone has the same level of faith, but we all have the ability to believe something. Right? The question is, what are we going to believe on? Right? We put that measure of faith in the wrong thing, but you know, notice how it's not just to some, it's to everyone. Another verse people will go to where it talks about, you know, they'll say God gives the faith and the repentance in 2 Timothy 2. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach. Just take note of that. Apt to teach. That means you have a good ability to communicate these complex things. Patient. In meekness. Right, So the, their character matters as well. Instructing those that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance, the acknowledging of the truth. And they'll say they're there. See? They only get saved because God gives them 
that change of mind. So what they mean by that is God changed their mind as opposed to gave them the ability to change their mind, right? Gave them the opportunity. Like, like when they preached to the Gentiles in Acts and they said, so hath God granted unto the Gentiles repentance unto life. What did they mean by that? Did God just change all their minds individually? Or did he say, no, God has allowed them to repent and turn to him. Now, if God is the one that makes them turn and chooses for them whether or not they will believe, why does all this matter? What does it matter whether you're thinking you weakness? What does it matter if you're apt to teach? What you're saying to them doesn't even matter because it's God's choice. You know, it's just, just like, a, like a fruitless, vain activity and I just do it because God told me to do it, but it makes no difference. And that's why Calvinists always end up, stop, they always see soul winning. Or their soul winning is completely heartless. That's why most people that are, you know, out there, turn or burn, you turn out, you wicked people! Because they don't, they don't think how they portray the message and how they share the truth of God's word makes a difference if God will give them, because God will give it to them, he wants to give it to them, won't give it to, they won't give it to them, I'm just going to repeat, re, preach repentance. And what they mean by that is, preach work salvation oftentimes you know turn from your sins to be saved but you see how when you take the view and a lot of Calvinists this is what they think is ultimately it doesn't matter what I say or how I am because it's God the one that's going to be going to be saving them and if you take that to its logical end you know what you're just going to stop solving because why bother when you don't make a difference you may as well just pray that God will get them saved. But that's not the case. We do make a difference. If somebody has rejected the gospel once, you know what, there's still an opportunity for them to not reject it. And that's our job to try and convince them, to try and change their mind, to get them to that supper. You know, that's our job. But what does it matter if it doesn't make a difference? Why, why would God even say, hey, you've got to be apt to teach, be gentle, be meek, don't strive, be patient with people? Because it makes a difference. Right? And it's saying here, if God gives them the opportunity, because God can because God can remove their opportunity. Right? So what you're hoping is that God has not removed their opportunity to be saved. Right? Repentance is acknowledging of the truth. Now another objection will be, well, we're chosen, we're elect. How can God not elect you know, how can we not be chosen of God or selected somehow when we're called the elect? Colossians, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, vows of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering. Sure, we are called the chosen, we are called the elect. But how does that work? This is where there's a different understanding. Is the Calvinists would say elect means each individual is elected. But how are we the elect? First Peter 2. But ye, plural, are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. This is the argument between Calvinists and non-Calvinists, is what is elected, right? This, this unconditional election. So we're saying it's not the individual, it is the group, the group that's elected. So let's go back to that analogy of Australia. You choose whether or not to join that nation but there are predestined benefits that you get for being part of that nation. Now, what God is saying when he elects a nation, it's like him saying, Australia is my chosen nation. Just like in Israel, he chose a nation. Not because of Jacob's doing, that's the nation that he chose, right? So it's like Australia is a nation, but you could join the nation of Israel. You could become a citizen of Israel. Right? You had to do certain things in order to be a citizen of Israel, but you could join that nation and then be part of God's people in the Old Testament. But now as believers, who, what's the nation that's chosen? It's the spiritual Israel, the spiritual commonwealth of Israel. How do you get your citizenship? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see how that works? So that's what it means by, we, are we an elect people, a chosen people? Yes. And how do you become part of that elect? You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and then you're part of of that elect people. That's how it works, right? With being chosen and elect. It's not the individual being given faith to believe on Jesus. John 15, 16. This is another one that they'll use. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth, go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye ask of the Father in my name, 
he may give it you. Now this is where you have to be careful with context of the passage. Because if they just take this verse out of context and say, look, you didn't choose to believe on God, he chose you to believe. Now, does that even say that? See, see how there's the assumption of what the verse actually says. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Chosen for what here? That's the question. Who is he talking to in John 15? Judas has already left to betray him. He's talking to the remaining 11 disciples that he's saying, I've chosen you. You didn't choose me to be the apostles, to be my disciples. Right? That's what he's choosing. Right? And he did. Because when you go out and see how he collected his disciples, his 12 apostles, they didn't choose him. He said, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Right? That's what he's talking about here. This is not talking about undoing everything else we've talked about, which is, you know, that whosoever will and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this passage is probably the hardest one for people. I'll explain. This is Acts 13, 48. This is probably the strongest verse that the Calvinist has. But there is an explanation for this. Acts 13. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad. So just to give you the, what's happening in Acts 13, Paul is preaching to a crowd of Gentiles and Jews. Right? And this is one of his great sermons. If you remember that sermon I preached on repentance, I read through that sermon. Right? It's a work that you will in no wise believe, yet a man declare out. He's preaching to them what has just happened. Because you remember at this time, not everyone knew what happened in Jerusalem, right? Not everyone knew what happened when Jesus was crucified. Not everyone knew that he had come and gone. Now they're spreading this news to believers around that this has happened, right? That's why sometimes when the Bible talks about people believing things, it doesn't necessarily mean that's the point they got saved. They're just believing what now has been testified and revealed that Jesus Christ has come and he was the Messiah. He's the Messiah that was foretold. Where some people, when they heard that, they rejected it. And that showed that they did not actually believe, right? So that's the passage here. The passage is he's preaching these things to this mix of Jews and Gentiles and there's division among them and there's fighting. The Jews reject what he's telling them, but the Gentiles did believe what he was telling them, right? about what Jesus had, had done. Heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. So how the Calvinist understands this, you see, he will say, because they were ordained, chosen by God, and that's what they think this ordained means, ordained just means appointed, but they'll say they were predestined to eternal life, that is why they believed. Right? And they'll say this believed, is that they got saved. Now, how would we understand this? How would we say, well, what, how do you explain this passage in light of every other scripture, right, that we've talked about? So you have to understand here that when Paul and Peter, and they're going around preaching, sometimes they are preaching to people that are already saved. And this, but this is the first time, like I said, they're hearing about Jesus. So what is going on here is that these Gentiles were actually saved. Right? So why are they ordained to eternal life? Because they have already believed on the Lord. They've called upon the Lord. You know, Jehovah, they would have known him by that name. Right? And they have eternal life. And what it's saying, all it's saying here is that the Gentiles that were saved believed what Paul was telling them about what happened to Jesus. Because not everyone did. Not even the disciples believed. Do you remember doubting Thomas? John 20, then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger, behold my hands, reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. Now is he saying to Thomas, you're not saved, get saved? No, he's saying believe that I've died and risen again. Right? Because not everyone that was saved believed what Jesus, that's why oh, the, the, like, were the apostles just like not saved the whole time? Like, you know, and, and every time they had a lapse in faith and everything, oh, this is when they lost their salvation. when they... No, it's because they were saved, but they didn't always believe everything Jesus was telling them, right? And this is like here with the Gentiles. The Jews rejected it. Maybe some of them were believers, and maybe still, I don't know. But here what it's saying is that the Gentiles that were saved, they accepted what Paul was saying. They believed what Paul taught about what Jesus did. It's not, the, this is where, the false assumption here, the assumption where you might get mixed up is that this is talking about the pre-choice of giving faith and this believed is talking about their salvation as opposed to them just believing what Paul was preaching and that they were already saved. But that, that's probably the hardest verse. 
that one. So if you understand that one pretty well, you said, okay? Okay, I know I preach a lot, like I said, but I'll go through these ones really quick. Tulip, total depravity, unlimited, uh, unconditional election. Number three, limited atonement. That's what L stands for, limited atonement. Now, what is limited atonement? Limited atonement is because they believe that God didn't choose everyone, they'd say, like, it would be a waste if Jesus shed his blood for all sins but that blood doesn't even get used. You know? they, so they have this idea, and I've heard it said all the time, it's like, you know, God wouldn't like waste his blood if it wasn't required. So they have this idea, limited atonement means Jesus only died for the ones that God elected. So you see how tulip, it all lines up. Because you're totally depraved, you need to be unconditionally elected, and God has only died for the people that are elected. So he didn't die for everyone. His atonement does not apply to everyone, right? His atonement only applies to a limited elect. Now let's look at what the Bible says. Let's compare this to the Bible. 1 Timothy 2. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Did he give himself a ransom for some? No, he gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. 1 Timothy 4, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. So hopefully the Calvinist accepts this saying as well. Right? It's a faithful saying, you can accept it. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, look at this, because we trust in the living God who is the saviour of all men, especially of those that believe. Do you know what that means? It means he's the saviour of those that don't believe as well. For the Bible to say he's the saviour of all men, especially of those that believe. Remember when the Bible says, do good unto all men, especially of those who have the household of faith? Is he saying, just be good to those of the household of faith, but be terrible to the people that aren't of the household? No, he's saying you're going to be good to all, especially of those of the household of faith. He's the saviour of all men, especially of those that believe. Why? Because that will actually then apply to them because they believe the salvation will apply to them. First John 2, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation, so a propitiation if you don't know what that means, it's like a satisfaction of God's wrath, right? Because God is obviously angry with the wicked every day. Jesus becomes the propitiation, he takes that wrath in our place. That's what propitiation is. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So you notice here, he's not only died and was the propitiation for those that are saved, but for everyone. You see? So it's not limited atonement. It is extended or it is done for all. Unfortunately, not everyone accepts the atonement that is available to them. Just like in the parable of the Great Supper, there was plenty of room and food for all, but not everyone came to eat. Right? So that is the L, limited atonement. Number four is the I, irresistible grace. Now, irresistible grace is the teaching that when God selects you and he gives you the faith and repentance, you will get saved. That's all it's saying. It's, saying you, it's not something you can resist. Everyone that God has elected to be saved will be saved. That's what an irresistible grace is saying. You cannot resist the will of the Holy Ghost. But is this true? Let's compare it with Scripture. Acts 7, look at this. Acts 7. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in, in heart and ears. Look at this. Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. So is it possible to resist the Holy Ghost? It is, right? Acts 7 here, this is Stephen, when he was stoned, he was preaching to the Jews, and he's saying to the Jews, you do resist the Holy Ghost as, you, you do always resist the Holy Ghost uh, as your fathers did, so did you. And I thought I'd pasted the following verse in there, but what he goes on to say is, how did they reject the Holy Ghost? They reject the Holy Ghost because when the pro God sent the prophets, they, you know, early and you know, rising up early, he talks about in the Old Testament, what did they do? They killed them. They persecuted. 
you know? And he's saying, like, you know, you guys now, now, like, glorify, you know, the sepulchres of all these prophets, but your fathers that, that you're the children of killed them, right? And you're the same. You killed Jesus. That's what he's saying to the Jews. Now, what are they doing? So what are you doing when you resist the Spirit? You are resisting God's Word, right? Because Ephesians 6, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, when you think of resisting the Spirit as though it's this supernatural force, which it is, but that's how most people think. They think like, well, you can't resist this supernatural force. But if you realize the Spirit of God, this supernatural force is the Word of God, and you think, how many people reject the Word of God? How many believers reject the Word of God? I mean, do you see how the Holy Spirit has power, but the Holy Spirit's power will only work in your life if you allow it to? That's why you hold the key to the door to open up. Like Jesus says, I, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you open up, then he can come in and sup with you. He doesn't just break the door down. Same with the Spirit of God. That's why it can be resisted. The Spirit of God can be resisted. And when you think, how many people reject what God's Word says, don't accept what God's Word How many believers, hopefully you in this church, don't. When you see God's Word, you accept what God's Word says. You don't resist the Spirit of God. But you can. And this is why the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, quench not the Spirit. Because you know you can quench the Spirit of God. How do you do that? It's like when Herod killed John the Baptist. He wanted God's Word out of his life. And that's like you getting out of church. That's like you saying, you know, I'm not reading the Bible. Not, that's you quenching the Spirit because now the Spirit has no power in your life because the Word of God is not in your life. So that's irresistible grace. Let's go on to P. P is perseverance of the saints. Perseverance of the saints. So perseverance of the saints is those that are saved, they will walk faithful unto the end. They will walk faithful unto the end. So this is not just, a lot of people think that the P in tulip stands for just eternal security. Once you're saved, you're always... Now, the Calvinist does believe in eternal security. Once saved, always saved. But they believe that everyone that is saved will be faithful unto them. What does that mean? That you'll live right all the way till the end. That's what they believe. Now, the danger of this doctrine of believing perseverance of the saints, because even people that are not Calvinists get duped into believing this sort of thing, that how, how you live is a basis for determining whether or not you're saved or not. Now, the danger of this doctrine is, that, is, is how it promotes a workspace salvation and how it makes people look to their works to see whether or not they're saved. And, you know, even if the Calvinists may say, because I've spoken to Calvinists and they'll say, like, look, but they'll say, look, Victor, how can I believe in work salvation when it's not me that's doing it? They'll say, like, it's not me that's doing it. It's, it's Jesus just working through me. That's what they say. So, how, that's not, so if they believe that, sure, I, I guess that's not work salvation because you're not trusting your works. You just believe God's working through you. But you know the danger if you preach this and you say people have to turn from their sins and if you haven't turned from all your sins, you're not persevering, you're not saved. You know what the, the, the reality of the experience is? So you know, as much as people might say to you, oh, it's not you doing it, it's God working through you. The reality of the experience is you made a choice to be here this morning. If you didn't make a choice to be here this morning, you'd be sleeping and you'd be doing something else. It takes effort, doesn't it? It takes effort to do the right thing. And it's not saying that God doesn't help you do the right thing, but you have to make a decision to go, look, I'm going to try and do the right thing. I'm going to try and walk in the Spirit. I'm going to let God work through me. It doesn't just happen. So you know it takes some effort. But if people are taught, well, it's just going to happen, it's just, just let God work through you, most people's experience is, I let God work through me and I went backwards. I went worse. So maybe I'm not saved. No. It requires you to walk in the Spirit so you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh thereof. You see? So that's why this is a dangerous doctrine and it makes a lot of people doubt their salvation for the wrong reason. So we're not, we don't persevere. That's not why we stay saved. We are preserved in Jesus Christ. The preservation of the saints. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father 
and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, right? So we don't preserve our own salvation. Jesus Christ preserves our salvation. Now, where do they get this? I want to go to Matthew 24. Where do they get this idea of this perseverance of the saints? You persevere unto the end, you'll be saved. Well, it's from Matthew 24. I just want to explain to you this passage. because This is, this is often a passage that is taken out of context. And if you take it out of context and you just assume every time the Bible says saved, it's talking about spiritual salvation, eternal salvation, you might miss the context of what this is talking about. Like when the Bible says about women, it says she'll be saved in child-rearing, in child-bearing. Is it talking about you have to bear children as a woman to get eternal salvation? No. What, is she being saved? what are they being saved from when they bring forth children? They're being saved from, you know, getting caught up with the, the stuff of the devil, right? And becoming a busybody, you know, all that sort of stuff. And, and that often is the case with ladies, right? You, it's good when they have children. It keeps them responsible and busy and they're not just being busybodies and tattlers. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what they're being saved from. But what are you being saved from here? Matthew 24. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. We know this is not talking about work salvation talking about the god and talking about being saved eternally what are you being saved from well matthew 24 if you're not familiar with matthew 24 is the olivet discourse when jesus is preaching about end times so this is talking about what is going to happen in the end times when there's tribulation and persecution like we've never seen before he says and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come right when jesus comes back when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolations, this is going to be an idol put in to the temple, the false temple that is rebuilt, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Let, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Why are you fleeing? Because if you don't, you're going to get physically killed. It's not that if you don't flee, you're going to lose your salvation. You're going to get physically killed by the tribulation and persecution that's going to come. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. He's saying, when this tribulation gets this bad, you're going to have to run. It's like on the plane. Don't take your bag. Don't go back for your luggage. Go. Get out of the plane. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. Oh, I must have uh, lifted out a verse here. Sorry. But it says here, in Matthew 24, unless those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. All right, so sorry, I skipped over a few verses there. But basically, what is this saying here? If you endure unto the end, you won't lose your life. Because you know what? If you flee and you, you realize, hey, the abomination of desolation is set up, I better flee into the mountains. If you flee, You'll be, you'll be saved. And it's saying here, the only reason why you'll be saved is because Jesus Christ returns. Jesus Christ returns, he shortens that tribulation, and that's the reason why your life will be saved. All right, so just in summary, five points. Now hopefully you understand what Calvinism is about. Total depravity, inability to believe on Jesus Christ. Unconditional election. God just arbitrarily chooses because we can't choose God and it's not based on anything we do, it's just based on God's choice. Limited atonement. God, Jesus did not die for everyone. He just died for the, the elect. Irresistible grace. Those that are chosen will be saved and perseverance of the saints is everyone that is saved will live right till the end. They'll endure unto the end. Now, we are not Calvinists. We reject all five of these points. But does that make us an Arminian? Possibly. Depends how you see it. Now, what is, Armi what is, what is Arminianism, right? Because when the Reformers got together and they were debating, they submitted their five points for consideration in contradiction to the five points of Calvinism. Now, what is known as the five points of Arminianism is basically the opposite. Partial depravity, so you have the free will to believe on Jesus. Conditional election, you have to believe to be part of the elect. Jesus died for everyone, universal atonement. Resistible grace, you can resist 
the call of the Holy Spirit. This is the one I don't agree with. This is why some people would call us four-point Arminian, but I read somewhere that Arminianism, not everyone accepts that, that are Arminians, which is good, because then maybe I am Arminian. <laughs> Arminian, Arminianist, whatever you say that. So if that's the case, then I am. If it's not the case, I'm a four-point Arminian, right? Falling from grace. So what, falling, what this fifth point is in Arminianism is because you have the free will to get saved, you have the free will to lose salvation, right? which is not true. You can't lose salvation. It's a one-way ticket. So this is, would be the right one. Preservation of the saints. And if that's Arminianism, I agree. We're Arminian. <laughs> but if it's not, then we're four-point um, four Arminian. Okay, so... In conclusion, I just hope this sermon, I know it's a bit of a deep one, hopefully you caught on trying to make the points clear, but I hope this sermon understands, helps you to understand what is meant by Calvinism and why our church is not Calvinistic. We're not Reformed theology, right? Biblical theology. Why we reject it, why we believe it to be false doctrine, and, um, and why I don't really like being called an Arminian because of this, but if what they mean is this, then that's fine. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, Lord, thank you that you freely give to everyone the opportunity to be saved. Lord, I pray that uh, people will. Lord, and I pray as well that you help us to make a difference in this world. And Lord, I pray that we would preach the gospel, win souls uh, out on the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that your house may be full while there's still the opportunity. So, Lord, we pray and thank you for your word. And, uh, Lord, help us to be a faithful servant, to go out, preach the gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.